Welcome to Thinking Women, the intelligent conversation show. And welcome for joining us for the first of three episodes that are going to celebrate International Women's Day this year and also across the years. So one of the things that we wanted to do was share a little bit of the history of International Women's Day with you and also have our wonderful guests as we normally do. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We? Well, did you know that International Women's Day started first in 1909? I didn't actually realise it had been going that long. So for 100 years. <laughs> and it was quite a socialist stroke communist movement at the time. And it was all about pay, women's rights, which, hang on, I don't think women had many rights at I mean, all at back time, then. We've so we've got some image, or an image here from around that time. Um, and as you can see, we've, things have changed hugely um, since these ladies um, and these ladies set, set this up. Mm, over yeah. 100 years ago. So all power to them, we set it all up. So yeah, so on these three shows, we're going to be looking at um, and talking to women in the arts in Cornwall specifically. So thank you to Cultivator Cornwall for supporting us on these shows. And who are you chatting to on so, these shows? So I have got Angela Hathrell and Jane Smith, who are from the Creative Contemporary Craft Hub. And they're going to be talking to us about the renovation of um, their building and also how they've rescued some, some arts materials from one of the universities that was closing the course. So a really inspiring story yeah. from those guys. Always inspiring stories, I think. Mary Oliver, the writer, is one of my guests who talks about her amazing book about her father, which is going to be made into a play. And the poet, Katrina Naomi, who um, actually has got some poems for us. So we're going to start the show with a poem from Katrina. I was commissioned to write this poem um, with the idea that women don't normally boast about their own achievements. Um, I found it really hard to start writing because I was thinking, well, what have I done in my life? And then once I got going, it was really hard to stop me. Boasting sonnet. I'm not one to brag, but Sharon Olds wrote me a poem. Me, from a council estate. I've done handstands on a skateboard downhill, yet failed both maths and English O-level. I'm still in love with the man I met at 18. I don't believe in marriage, but once won an award for headbanging and chaired human rights talks at the UN. Expelled from school, I'm now a PhD. I don't wear makeup. This is the real me, unless I'm doing panto in Cornish. I'm a qualified mountain leader. Wish you could see my scything and Lindy Hop. I'd say much more, but sonnets make you stop. Our next guest is award-winning poet, Katrina Naomi. Welcome to the show, Katrina. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So I want to talk about, well, you do many things, but let's talk about your poetry first of all. Um, you came to poetry late, didn't you? Tell yes. me the journey that got you from where you were okay. to where you are now. Okay. Um, well, I didn't probably read a poem until I was 30. Um, Obviously, like everybody, you do poetry at school, and I hated poetry at school. I hated school. Um, I mean, I think it was just because all the poetry that we were looking at, certainly at that time, um, it was, you know, it was dead white men. It was the and war poets. Probably, yeah. I did not really <laughs> pay much attention to it. But, um, it was just, there was nothing that was sort of related to my life. I was sort of like, you know, uh, growing up on a council estate, you know, and it's like, where's anything that re relates at all to me? So I just, you know, thought poetry was just elitist nonsense, really, so paid it no attention. Um, and then I, after a while, I began writing um, really bad crime stories, like really bad. Um, <laughs> they were all girl meets boy, girl murders boy, that sort of thing. Um, Did the girl always murder the boy? Yeah, always. <laughs> uh, so that's why, you know, not a lot of variety there. Um, so... Um, and then I went on a course, and as it happens, the course was in Cornwall for a weekend to learn how to write uh, fiction, which is what I thought I wanted to do. Um, so I began 
on, on, on this course, we were asked to write something really from the heart. And I wrote something, and then we all had to read it. I'd never read anything out before, so I was petrified. Had to read them, you know, finally read this thing out. And the tutor went, Ooh, made this sort of funny little noise, which I now know is the poetry noise. It's like a, Ooh. Um, and she just sort of said, oh, can I have a look at it? And um, I thought, well, that means she thinks it's really terrible. Um, so she, and she said to me, well, you've written a poem. And I said, well, I can't have, because I don't know anything about poetry, and I think it's elitist nonsense, all the rest of it. And she said, well, it's even set out like a poem, which was a bit bizarre, really, but it was. Um, and so she said, why don't you go on an adult education class and, you know, study poetry? So I started going on an adult education class, and um, from the... I had a brilliant tutor, Julia Casterton, um, and, um, yeah, she just brought in Sharon Olds. It was one of the first poems who I actually ended up, on a long, long way ahead, did my PhD on Sharon Olds um, and a, three other poets. Um, so, yeah, it just got me really hooked from just thinking it could be really different types of poetry. You can write about anything you want. You know, it doesn't have to be sort of fluffy clouds and that sort of thing. So um, and this was like, yeah, this is poetry that speaks to me. This is about my life. And um, so I just became really excited. Um, it took me a long time to be published. I mean, don't get me wrong. It wasn't someone who, like, just started doing this thing and then suddenly I was any good at it. You know, you have to, it's quite hard work to, you know, right, you're not working down a mine, but you're, um, you know, you're slogging away trying to get best words in the right order. And, um, and we've just heard one of your poems then and we've got another one later on in the show oh, okay, great. Um, which is really lovely so thank you mm. so much for for your performance oh, and you. was there anything I know we were chatting earlier on in the green room you we were chatting mm. with Luke mm. was there anything particular in in your life that that inspired you um, in your poems and in your work um, that you, yeah. you want to talk um, about? I wouldn't maybe not inspire might not be the the best word but I was attacked when I was 19 um, and um, someone tried to rape me basically and um, I think something like that happens um, I was you know just trying to think um, you know how can I sort of try and turn this around for myself because it's not really something that leaves you in life I think when yeah. something like that happens. Yeah. We had I think mm. one of our previous shows we talked mm. about events that happen that actually yeah. trigger something make you know inspire it yeah. not the right word no, but sort but of trigger a different yeah a different um sort of creative path yeah and um, to being able to turn that around is is well massive. Huge. um i think it was sort of trying to you know understand for myself um you know how i felt how this was impacting on my life and still does um and um and, and I was angry, you know, and I think ang anger is quite a good energy. Um, obviously, you're going to be angry, but to try and use that in a way to think, OK, let's do something creative with that. But say, it took me a long time to find what the creative thing was. And it, for me, it's turned out to be, to be poetry. Yeah, to channel that energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, when I write about a lot of subjects, but sexual violence and, you know, sort of uh, men's mistreatment of, of women is something that comes up. Yeah, quite and a on bit International in Women's Day, obviously, it's, it's a real mm. theme um, for, about, about that stuff. So we really, yeah. we really mm. value you, you sharing that with us. Yeah. And tell us about your sea swimming, because oh, yeah. we, we do like <laughs> a bit of sea swimming okay. on Thinking Women, don't we? Yes. Um, so tell us about that. How did you get into that? And um, oh. where do you where And do also you, how um, you used it yeah. Yeah. Creative, okay. creatively, because um, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, I swim most days, not every day, but I swim most days. Um, and um, I think in the, in the other poem, I sort of say, you know, and she refuses neoprene, so I don't wear wetsuits. Um, <laughs> oh, hardcore. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I just love it. And, um, but I find it's really helpful for my creativity. Um, so I get up first thing, have a cup of tea, get straight in the sea and, um, you know, and swim as far as I can, depending on how cold or warm the water is. And so at the moment, I'm not in there for you know, it might be 10 minutes um but 10 minutes is enough isn't it i mean yeah. even that no it it's, is it's great um, yeah, it's but it, it just really gives awaken. you um or it gives me anyway just sort of a lot of energy and um i find while i'm swimming um i'm often sort of thinking of you know what i might be writing when i get back to my desk yeah. so that tends to be what happens is that i sort of um 
you know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not sort of writing a whole poem while I'm swimming. I'm just sort of thinking but about... The ideas sparking, come, yeah. don't or they? sparking enough to, to, to win an, a very prestigious award <laughs> from, <laughs> from that poem. Yeah, Tell, tell us you. about, tell us um, about the, the, the prestigious award. Yes, um, I was, uh, yeah, um, I won the Keats Shelley Award, which is, um, which is amazing. Um, and that was for the, in the, um, in the kelp forest poem. Where I swim in Penzance, there, there, you know, there is this massive forest of, of kelp and you do have to negotiate and you do have to get used to it if you're going to swim there, particularly for swimming at low tide, um, because it is all around you. And I think to begin with, I found that really quite hard because it is a bit slimy and it is, what's that? Um, and now I'm sort of a, a lot braver with it. So, um, yeah. and it's, you know, also I've just thought, yeah, because it's, you know, I wouldn't have written that poem. And it's by the Otherwise, beautiful poem, yeah. so. And, and so. the one we've just heard about mm. boasting, I love that oh, because, oh you. my goodness, that is something mm. that, you know, oh, you shouldn't show off, you shouldn't, no. you know, and, and it's just so mm. lovely to celebrate that. Yeah. And I know Lou and I were chatting earlier mm. and we were saying we, we might, we, um, we'd love to hear anyone else's boasting poems. We're inspired. Yes. By we are inspired, yes. Because, but, yeah. and I think, you know, we're doing these shows um, to, to celebrate International Women's mm. Day and right. the idea of a boasting sonnet mm. as an International Women's Day celebratory event is mm. just, it's just perfect because we, we're, we're not really allowed to, or we're not encouraged mm. to boast yeah. as women. So tell us about the, pro so when you were asked to write that poem, yeah. how did you yes. feel? Um, I should give a shout out to Project Boast, um, which is from Bristol. And um, they were sort of saying, yes, that they felt women didn't really talk as much as men about their achievements and that um, we tended, you know, not all women, not all of the time, but on the whole, perhaps we tend to not shout out about what we're doing. Um, and they commissioned me and um, a couple of other women um, and then they produced this anthology called Project Boast, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, the poem went in my latest book, Wild Persistence. So very happy about that. Um, but they, yeah, they just sort of said, well, anything, you know, anything you've done in your life that you think might be interesting. And I was, to begin with, it was like, well, what, you know, sort of, what could it, what could it be? And then, yeah, as I said, once, once I got going with it, you sort of thought, yeah, well, I've done this and I've done and that. Aren't and aren't I amazing? Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure because it, it is, it's, I just think mm. it's such a, it's such a, such a simple, mm. but cleverly intelligent idea to ask a particular woman to yeah. think about, because I could imagine if it, I was asked that question, I'd have a, I'd be blank for a, a bit. Well, I was, yes, I really was. I mean, I was, you know, it, um, I sat down for a few times to try and sort of think, well, what could I include? And um, it did take a while for sort of things to come through. And then I was thinking, well, think about, you know, you worked in human rights for a long time. I did chair or something at the UN, you know, which is even now I think, really, did I? Yeah, I did. You know, so, but um, I, I love the, yeah. the, the fact that you had in there doing a handstand on a skateboard yeah. because that's, re that's really, really impressive. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, if I'd have done that, that would be in my <laughs> story as well. Well. It, Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. But it's, it's so lovely because I think about journaling, if anyone's done mm. any journaling, and there's always mm. that question, you know, what are you proud of? But yeah. proud of is different to what yeah. you boast about. Yes. You know, and, yeah. and I think that's just such a lovely mm. thing to, to do and encourage. Also, I'm going to encourage my kids to, well, you've got my girls, girls to do yeah. that, yeah. to write their own boasting mm. sonnets. And I want to ask, you know, you are a feminist. Yes. writer and yeah. feminist poet and again as on mm -hmm. international women's day um celebration what do you where do you see the female voice in poetry mm. now these um, days i well, hope it's changed yeah no i think it's really changed i think when i started um well writing poetry or, or going along to poetry events you know it was um predominantly male most of the editors for for magazines tended to be white men um, and things are really changing far more black people coming into poetry and winning the big prizes I mean, it's just really good to see um, you know people of all genders um, you know disabled poets I mean everybody is now in the mix and um, I, you know I think there's far more sort of equality in what's happening with poetry now and it's so much the better for it otherwise if mm. we only can hear you know the you know 
poetry does have a very sort of elitist tag to it, you know, and um, I think if it is only like those who can afford to write poetry, then who wants to read those poems? About yeah. what they're writing about. Yeah, I mean, we want to write, you know, we want to hear about sort of like, you know, ordinary lives. Yeah. And, um, you know, ordinary and extraordinary lives. And it sounds like you've had a very extraordinary, <laughs> lovely and ordinary in some ways life. But you've got a book, so um, got, where yeah, can people get a hold of a copy of your book? Well, I've got my, I've got my last three books oh, here. Three books? I've got, I've published five. Uh, five or seven, seven actually now. Um, my last book is Wild well, Persistence, um, which is published by Seren. Um, and Love the cover. Thank you. Yes, uh, dancer. Um, because Martha you are Wayne. a dancer as I am well. A dancer, yes. Um, most recently, I collaborated with Helen Mort um, and we produced this um, Same But Different, which is published by Hazel Press. And the other recent book is The Way the Crocodile Taught Me, which is also published by Seren. Fabulous. Amazing. And we'll put details of those on our social media so that you, you can have a look. So thank you so much for Trina, being Thank you so much for sharing everything us. with us. Thank you. Oh, it's been thank lovely you. talking with you both. Thank you. And thank you. So we're delighted to have in the studio with us Angela Hatherell and Jane Smith from the Creative Contemporary Crafts Hub in Camborne and you're the founding directors of this project which is quite an amazing project because it brings together um, craft workshops for the community and also um, it's renovating a building. So tell us how this all started and what it is you're actually doing. Well we're um, building literally from scratch uh, a contemporary craft hub um, for the community and the crafts we will be delivering is ceramics, glass and jewellery or small metals and we, we were lucky enough to be able to access equipment from Falmouth University that was no longer needed because of contemporary crafts closing and it was really important that that equipment stayed in the community um, so could be accessed by everybody and also stayed in Cornwall. Brilliant. And, and who is coming to the workshops? Who's invited to come along and, and how do people get involved? The ethos is that creativity is for everybody. So um, we want to be, I know a lot said about levelling up, but we want to be true levelling up that this amazing equipment that isn't available anywhere else in Cornwall to the public um, is available for everybody. So we do community activities, creativity for mental health activities, but right through to specific workshops for professional artists to come and upskill and um, be able to use the equipment. So and we also offer equipment hire. So we have these, these huge kilns that maybe a professional artist who wants to upscale their work would be able to use. So everybody is the short answer to and that I question. We were talking just in the green room earlier about the lack of these things now in schools. So mm. it's very difficult for young people to access the equipment they need to train and to, to enter into these sorts of, of crafts and professions. And that means that skills are being lost. Yeah. That if children and young people aren't learning these skills and have access to these facilities in schools, then they're not going to ever have the opportunity to become potters yeah. or um, glass artists. Yeah, which we need so much. And it's not just the end product as well. We were talking, it's the creative process. So it's what people get out of, of creating mm. the, the parts. Mm. You, we the actually have glasses. people come in and they go, oh, I'm not, I'm not creative. And you, you can see this anxiety when they start working. And then you see them relaxing and enjoying the process and being there. Um, and handling, I mean, if you're handling clay, you're handling the earth. Yeah. It's as good as gardening. Yeah, it, quite a natural yes. thing to do. Yeah. And, and, and it's a safe place. For people to mm -hmm. come and try, try something new. I mean, I go to I go to a craft shop with my kids, but I don't think I try glass making or pottery at home. Like we've done other things, but no. not. But I think I'd want somewhere to, to do that. Um, so we've got a picture here of the building that you are working in. And tell us a little bit about the renovation. It's a beautiful building. So so how did this come about, and what work are you doing to it? Through Cultivator um, and Tonya Liu, who was on the town deal board for Camborne, which is, was their um, application to central government for um, levelling up funding, for town deal funding. Um, and they wanted a creative offer 
for their, um, their bid to central government for some funding. Um, they knew that we had this expertise and that this equipment, um, we were looking for a home for it. So they invited us to be their creative offer. So we worked with Camborne Town Deal. Um, we looked at a couple of different buildings in, in Camborne and this we just fell in love with this building. Yeah, it's it's a grade two star listed um, kind of neo uh, classical um, Gothic revival. No, sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's like a little mini Greek temple. It is. It's, isn't it? it's, I mean, it's I recognise really that. I've, I've been past lovely it a building. Few times, so it's so nice that it's been uh, yeah. it's been used. And, and we've got. We, I was I was going to say, tell us a bit about the renovation because mm -hmm. I know that you're using some of the the craft work that's going on in the renovation. I think we've got a photograph of this. Here we go. So what are these what are these guys doing here? They're making ceramic tiles, individual ceramic tiles that are going on a community. Uh, mosaic, which is actually talking about Camborne and the Red yeah. River, which it was red because of the iron oxide and all the other minerals from the mining that ended up in the river. And so the, the mosaic depicts the heritage, the industrial heritage of Camborne, um, this Red River flowing through it, and that's been made out of glass tiles, wow. which we've also fired. Um, in Campbell. And I think we've got a picture of the tiles as well. These are the it's ceramic beautiful. ones and those are the from the periodic table, the minerals that are in the river. Oh. So it's, it's going to be very educational too. It is, yeah. yeah. It's really and well thought out. How many tiles are you going to create for this I mosaic? No, I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. It's, it's too it's many. In the thousands, I would yeah. have oh, thought. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And that's such a lovely project as well, isn't it, for the community, for everyone to sort of take everyone part and involved in. you can say, oh, well, that was my tile that I did or, mm. or we did together. So. Yes, and oh, they can have their piece thing. of the building, but it's going to be there forever. This, this building is mm. nearly 200 years old and we're hoping it's going to last for yeah. at least another 200 years. Oh, what a fabulous mm. initiative. Mm. Well, thank you so much for coming talking to us about it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and we've put all the details of the project on the screen, so hopefully you've seen them or you can have a look on our website. Thank you so much, Andrew mm. and Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Our next guest is Mary Oliver, who is a teacher turned writer. Now, Mary, you became a writer a little bit late, later in life, didn't you? Very much so, yes, after I retired from art teaching, yeah. And was there a moment of inspiration that took you from art teaching to writing? Mm. Was there a moment that just... Well, there was really, yes. Something quite dark happened in my life, in the family, that I felt I had to deal with. And um, I realised it was through writing that I was going to do this. And um, that was the beginning of it. I didn't, didn't expect anything to get published, but it did after a few years. It arrived and um, you know, it's been great ever since then. And I take it you were intimating, was that the book about your father? Yes, that was the, yes. So let's talk about that. There it is, yeah. <laughs> of course. Jim Neat, yeah. who's your dad? That's, that was my dad, yeah. Mm. So what... what but well, it's an amazing story. I've read about Have it. You, but, yeah. But could you a little appraise you the story and just give our mm. viewers a little bit of an idea what it's all about. Well, he was a very quiet man, very repressed, and I never really knew anything about him. He was a mysterious presence in my life. And you know, I had quite a sad childhood for various reasons. And a long time after he died, this thing happened, and um, I realised that I really needed my dad, and I didn't know who he was or who he'd mm. been. So um, I thought I need to find out. So I started researching. And it led to, um, you know, a quite astounding family secrets really being revealed, which explained why he'd been, why he'd been. Mm. So it made a huge difference to my life after mm. that. So I kind of gave him a voice through writing it. And I discovered that I hadn't really had a voice myself up until then either. And I, so I found my own voice through writing it. And that was the the great experience that came out of it for me, really. And how different you from being an artist to being a writer, two very different artistic mediums, I take it, or, or are there similarities? Well, no, you say I've, you found your voice, yeah. but obviously it was something different to when you were creating your art. Yeah, it was different and it worked better for me, but there are similarities so that I could transfer from, from one to the other because it's this thing about making a work of art work, 
you know, what is it that makes it work? And I feel I'd studied that and I could apply the same skills really to my writing. You know, it took me 10 years to write that and oh I had gosh. to learn how to write really. Um, and it was that crafting of the experience um, that turned it into, you know, what was a small work of art as opposed to just expressing my feelings. And that was what was important. Mm. And that's what I now like to teach, is the crafting of it. I was going to ask you about those 10 years of writing the book, though. Yeah. Was that an enjoyable 10 years or was it a painful 10 years? Actually, it was very enjoyable. I just felt I was doing the right thing. I loved every minute of it. I couldn't wait to get out of bed in the morning. Oh, yeah. OK. So that, that, that when you say you found your voice, you, yeah. you had found something inside, mm. dormant inside you as well. Yeah. And of course, now you say you've, you've found that and you, you want to share that with other women largely? Or yes. Is your it's mainly women. I mean, although the subject here was my father and I think men's mental health is obviously as important as women's. But, um, you know, what I find I want to do now is to work with women, um, many of whom have had really difficult things happening in their lives and they've maybe dealt with it, they're getting on with their life, but it's there and they maybe need to tell their story and find their voice. They don't necessarily know how, how to do that, how to go about it. And I find that um, what I really enjoy doing is working with them, helping them find their voice, helping them find a way of distilling the experiences that they had and um, focusing on them and crafting the um, material that they've got so that what they end up with isn't just an expression of their feelings, but it's something, it's a small work of art, an object that they can handle, but they can also share with other people. Other people can read it and identify with it mm -hmm. and maybe realise that they'll be able to find their voice as well. Mm -hmm. So it's working with women one-to-one -one that I find is um, you know, what's most important to me at the moment. And what would you say to a young woman, let's say, because we, we are doing these shows yep. in celebration of International Women's yep. Day. So I'm re I am generally interested in, in women writers and women in literature and yep. how women come to writing and how women are presented in writing. Yep. But from your point of view, you know, how would you advise a young woman or woman of any age first coming to writing? How to find your voice, to have to start, because mm. I think it could be quite a terrifying moment to step over that threshold, and you've been there, so. Yeah, well, I think I'm quite good at putting them at ease so that they don't feel that fear, because I do know what that's like. So um, I get them to write very freely, first of all, so that they are just expressing their feelings. Um, and then you end up with a whole load of material, some of which is fantastic. You know, there'll be little gems in there that are amazing. Some of it is, you know, a load of rubbish. So what you go through is you, you, what you do is you go through pulling out the little gems. You let the nonsense disappear. And then you work on those gems and expand them and um, craft and edit them until you've got something really amazing. Fantastic. And I would say if anyone's interested in joining Mary on her courses, we'll put all the details at the bottom of the show so okay, people can get thanks, hold of yeah. you. So let's go back to the book, which is becoming a play. Yes, it's being turned into a stage play by a young woman, screenwriter. Um, and I think she's changing it quite a lot. It's changed its title. It's now called My Father's Daughter. And... Um, we're looking for funding because obviously to tour a play and to go to venues around Cornwall, which was what we planned to do initially, it requires you know, quite a bit of money. So we are actually launching a crowdfund tomorrow. It's called um, My Father's Daughter Crowdfund, I think. And um, that will enable us to rehearse it and um, you know, get all, everything necessary to two of the various venues that we do have booked already. So she's done a super job on it and um, it's been a fantastic experience working with her and the potential director and the producer and various actors that we've worked with. So it's, you know, it was a very lonely process really writing the book, but turning it into a play has become, made me very 
busy and sociable an ensemble experience yeah. as well it's teamwork yeah. it's been fantastic and a whole new avenue of creativity yeah. that you've yeah. gone i love that journey yeah you know it just shows you though you're never it's never too late you're no, never too old you're absolutely never... no I'm more kind of active and creative than I've ever been, really. I'm Fantastic. feeling better about it. Now, that's yeah. very inspiring as an yeah. International Women's Day story. Yeah. Um, Mary, thank you so much for joining us. That's and great. please keep in touch okay. because you must come back on when the play is yeah. ready to go or, or, or the play's done. And, yeah. and, and we'll talk about that again. Okay, we'll let you know. Okay. Mary, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you to all of our guests and thank you for joining us on the first of this trilogy of shows for International Women's Day. Yeah, thanks to our guests, um, Mary and Angela and Jane. And well. we're going to end the show with a poem from Katrina. Thank you to her. So look out for our next two shows coming soon. In the Kelp Forest. The first time she finds herself among brown strands, between fear and wonder, floating in this other world of upside down. A place a person could wed herself to. So much dank silence beyond her breath, the gentle murmur of limbs in suspension, their arc and splay. There's no peace like this in the dry country. She's like a body in a jar at the lab, but keeps her Dutch colours, sliding her mind through slender lengths of weed, fabric-like, plastic-like, part translucent, part shine, like nothing else but kelp. Her restless hair goes on its own pulsing journey. She forgets for blissed moments. She can't breathe here. This isn't air. Waves nudge overhead. It's like any place almost visited. Say a city, say Seville. And she talks half seriously, half what if, of how she might live here. The kelp wafts in welcome, displays its tentacles as she refuses neoprene, longs for kelp's beckon and touch, longs to pass as a local, a strange fish for sure, but one who could belong. <laughs>